Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Brian, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your mic, microphones, and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on June 24th. That's next week on Wednesday. Um, it's 2020 update basics of ancestry.com with James Tanner. And that'll be at 5.30, just like this week. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Sarah Cochran, who will be giving a presentation on locating records and archives from your couch. Sarah Cochran has been conducting genealogical research for over 25 years, and her research has taken her into nearly every state in the USA, as well as Ireland and Britain. She holds a Boston University Genealogical Research Certificate, as well as a bachelor's degree in library science, and is an alumnus of the ProGen Study Group. She especially enjoys breaking down brick walls for her clients, discovering the stories of Black sheep ancestors, and helping individuals preserve their photographic legacy. She began her career as a professional genealogist in 2016, after spending over 11 years working for a pre-employment background check company. She is currently the treasurer of the Southern California chapter of the Association of Professional Genealogists, the registrar for the Arantia chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution and volunteers at, and volunteers at the National Archives Riverside office. And if Sarah's ready, then we'll turn the time over to her. Hi, Bryant. I'm all set. Thank you so much for having me uh, this evening, and thank you to everyone who's uh, here tonight uh, for joining us. We are going to talk about locating records in archives from your couch. It's a very handy place to do it. Uh, you know, today here in 2020, we, we live in kind of the golden age of genealogy. And long gone are the days of hunched backs from bending over heavy ledger books that you know, we can't even lift them, strained eyes from hours of microfilm readers, and buying extra bo boxes of tissues before we start researching in these big dusty basements. And those mountains of photocopies and hand cramps from transcribing records that, you know, we, we can't photocopy, Nah, it's all thing of the past. Today, we get to sit at home in our favorite chair, a snack and beverage in hand, and research our ancestors from our laptop or tablet and download images straight to our computer. Indexing and optical character recognition makes finding our ancestors in records like newspapers, will, and censuses a breeze. And in the golden age of genealogy, researching our family trees has never, ever been easier now that it's all online, right? Wrong. So we're going to talk first about some of the myths of doing genealogical research in the 21st century and why those myths exist. Well, it's all online. That's a big one. And why do people think this? Well, let's take a look at some numbers. Ancestry, uh, states that they have over 24 billion records available at their website. My Heritage says over 12 billion. In their 2019 end year review, Family Search stated they had over 6 billion searchable records. And of course, they're aggressively digitizing that vast microfilm collection to add to the number, and they've been working on indexing as well. Find My Past has over 2 billion records, half of which are from the British Isles. I've saved you the math. That's about 44 billion records available at those four websites all by themselves. Um, from when I wrote this a few years ago, it's a 7 billion record increase. And as we know, state and federal archives are digitizing records. There are whole websites dedicated just to newspapers or to yearbooks. And many private and organizational records are going online as well. 
I would not at all be surprised to learn that those other resources combined match or exceed the number of records at these four big sites. So we've got a lot of records available to us already online. And especially for those people who have already, uh, who've really only started researching during this digital age, it does seem a little hard to believe there's still more out there. So it's all online. Well, some people are kind of realizing that's not true, uh, so they go into myth number two. If it's not online, it doesn't exist. Uh, no, no, well, that one's not true either. But, you know, it's, it's a fairly common thought. I see this uh, fairly often. And really, there's an entire generation, if you will, of self-taught genealogists who have only done their research online. And they just simply haven't been exposed to microfilms and dusty courthouse basements. So they don't realize um, that all the stuff that was online is online came from offline. And then we have myth number three. Well, if it exists, it will be online eventually. So why does this one exist? I think there's two big reasons. One, you know, it's some wishful thinking, you know, considering the speed at which records have been digitized over the last, you know, 20 odd years. Um, I don't blame anyone for thinking that getting it all digitized is possible. I mean, you know, this, just those two, those four big websites added 7 billion records in the space of about two years. So it's, it's moving right along. But I also think there's a lack of understanding about just how much there is to be di digitized that hasn't been. The reality is that there are probably trillions of pages of genealogically relevant records out there in the wild, in archives, libraries, institutions, private collections, and local government agencies. What's online barely scratches the surface, and it's taken decades to get here. So getting to the rest of it will take a while. And there are some records that will probably never be digitized or made available online. So this one kind of busted. All right, so let's, let's look at why these things won't be online. Well, first we have the old supply and demand issue. I'll give you an example. There's a collection of letters. It's currently held as part of a special collection at the Tomas Riviera Library at the University of California, Riverside, uh, which is fairly near me. These letters were written in the early 1800s by a woman named Anne Harris. Now, Anne lived in England, and she sent these letters to her sweetheart, Richard, who also lived in England. There's no evidence that these two ever married or had children together, uh, but Anne mentions her siblings fairly often, uh, as well as talks about the families she worked for. Descendants of those siblings or those families would probably be very interested in this collection of letters. But how often do you think it gets requested by a patron? Probably not very often. Uh, probably one of the few. Uh, libraries and archives have limited budgets. So the reality is that this collection may never make it onto the list of items to be digitized. On the other hand, the Tomas Riviera Library has an extensive collection of materials about the Tuskegee Airmen. Now, these records are likely to be requested often, so it's worth the time and money for the archive to digitize them, ensuring access to patrons while limiting the handling of the record, helping to preserve them for the future. Fragility of the records does factor in. The records from the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, including pension and land bounty files, have taken priority for digitizing over other records, such as from the Civil War or the wars of the early 1900s because those records are both in high demand from research for researchers and are in physically worse condition which isn't to say that the archives isn't caring for them properly they are doing everything that they can to ensure these records are preserved for as long as possible but as this famous character reminds us you know aging can be a little hard on the looks so they're trying to take care of these records and make sure that they will last forever or as long as possible. Now sometimes it's the law that determines what if or when records can be digitized and placed online. The 19 federal, 1950 federal census certainly exists, but because of the law, the public cannot view it until 2022. So that's just a matter of waiting. But you know, there's other laws. In the state of Wisconsin, uh, if you order a death certificate, they will send it to you and they will stamp in big bright red letters uh, that it is illegal 
to digitize and post that online. I have a picture of that for you, but I didn't want to get in trouble with Wisconsin. Privacy and identity theft are other concerns and other reasons that many records may not be digitized, at least not in the near future. The first social security numbers were issued in November of 1935, meaning that most individuals alive today in the United States at least have one. And though these numbers were not originally intended to become an identifier, they became that over time. Now the solution um, to give access to records and still uh, use the safety of, you know, high, of redacting that social security number, um, it's a manual process. It adds significantly to the cost in both dollars and time of digitizing. So it's more effective to just delay putting them, making them available. And speaking of dollars, it is expensive to digitize these records. Um, and most of these institutions, if not all of them, are on budgets. So priority tends to be given to collections that are frequently accessed, especially if they're already in delicate condition. Uh, my own, I first started volunteering at the National Archive. My the first project they gave me was to um, remove all the staplers and fasteners uh, from a portion of the collection of the Chinese exclusion case files held by that office. Uh, their, uh, the digitizing process was about to begin. So I was assigned nine five-inch boxes uh, from the record group, and those take about four hours to do half a box, so about a box per business day, because there are a lot of staples in these uh, records, and you have to work very slowly and carefully to not damage the documents as you're removing them. So it took me about two business weeks to process the entire section that I had been given. Now, I was a volunteer, so there's no... Uh, you know, the, NAR, the NARA system doesn't have to pay me a salary, they don't have to pay, pay for an employee benefit or anything like that, but if they did, you're looking at, you know, $800 to $1,000 just in salary plus everything else. Um, it also doesn't include things like rent, building rent or electricity uh, or supplies, uh, anything like that. And it definitely doesn't include the hundreds of hours it's taking to scan these, these documents. They have started the scanning process and some of these wonderful records are now online. Uh, but the point is, it really adds up fast. Digitizing is expensive. All right. So with all that, we have faced the ugly, painful truth. If we want to do thorough research to reconstruct the stories of our forebears, we are simply not done yet with dusty basements, strained eyes of the microfilm readers, and contacting courthouses and libraries across the world. But how do we track down and access the records that will be valuable to our research without leaving the comfort of our own homes? Well, before we get to that answer, and we will, let's talk about a couple challenges. You know, first of all, our ancestors didn't always stay in one place. You know, even the ones who were born, were raised, and died on a single plot of land didn't always stay in the same place. It is absolutely not uncommon to discover that government borders change around our ancestors. Uh, when I was a very beginning beginner research researcher, I was often puzzled at how my family could pick up their big farm and move it from county to county every 10 years with the census. And of course, that's not what was happening. Um, the borders were changing. It's also not uncommon to discover that our ancestors actually did their business in neighboring counties. If uh, the courthouse for the neighboring county uh, was, you know, a couple miles down a nice straight path of road, they might be more inclined to go to that courthouse uh, or to those schools rather than uh, climb over the mountain to their own courthouse. That's physically easier to get to. But our ancestors move and the borders moved and the records moved too. They just didn't stay put. Now this is especially true of records that are transferred from a county level up to a, say, a state archive, but is also true of unpublished manuscripts, a category of records which includes items like family Bibles, personal letters, you know, like collection of letters that were written in, River, in England, somehow now live in Riverside, California. So the records move around. 
we also tend to miss out on information about our own families by not fully researching those fan club members, the friends and extended family, associates and neighbors, the folks who interacted with our ancestors on a regular basis, either in person or by mail. So, how are we going to increase our odds at finding records that are going to help us? Let's talk strategy. First, you need to identify what question you have about your person. I want to know everything about second great grandpa J James Jackson is simply not a focused question. It will not be particularly helpful for you and you're going to miss some things. But a more focused question such as who were the parents of James Jackson born in Livingston County, Kentucky 1852 will guide you towards records more likely to help you find what you want to know. Once you have your question, make a list of the types of records that are most likely to answer your question. Using my uh, who are the parents exam question, um, a death record, an obituary, maybe a marriage record. These are all records that commonly list parents' names, so I want to look for those. But I also want to look for the marriage, death, and obituaries for siblings you may have had. Assuming that those records don't give us an answer, or maybe we're getting some conflicting answers, what else could be useful? Well, uh, land records, he might have purchased or inherited something from his father. Wills are probates to see if he shows up as an heir. Uh, in this case, I've got a fellow born in 1852. So it's just the right time period for um, his father to have served in the Civil War. So looking through Civil War pensions and uh, servicemen who could be a father or widow pensions of potential mothers, um, would be a good idea since he would have been a minor when the war ended and probably listed in that pension. But also diaries and letters written by members of the fan club could actually help us. So we think about those, those friends, associates, and neighbors who might have created records. Make a list. And don't forget to notate where those people may have lived when they created the record. Uh, using our Civil War example, um, I have a third great grandfather, his name was John Streeter, who was in the Civil War. Now he was taken prisoner at the Battle of Buzzard's Roost and subsequently uh, was imprisoned and died at Andersonville Prison Camp. His widow immediately filed for a pension, I mean the minute she could she filed for it. And there are affidavits in her pension from men who had served with John and men who had been imprisoned with John. So these are people who were not from the same community as John originally, but who came in contact with him because of this war. So I would definitely be wise to go learn a little bit more about those fan club members, see what accounts they may have left behind since they survived the war. Even if my ancestor isn't named specifically in those records, um, it would certainly give me uh, that first-hand account of what was going on and that would help me understand uh, John's, uh, the end of his life. And since they were from other communities, I want to make sure to list the places these records may be at and where they may have been created. Um, I uh, refer to on a regular basis the U.S. Map Guide to the Federal Census. It's by Th Thorndale and Dollarhide. Now this book shows between 1790 and 1920, it was published in 1987, so the 1920 census was the most recently released, but it shows the evolution and the changing of the county lines in U.S. states and territories between that very first federal census up to uh, that most recent one. So this is really handy for figuring out where some are, someone was at a specific point in time. So you might be uh, looking in the county where the person died, but when they were born they were actually part of another county. So that'll help you find those places and those times. Once you've done all that, it's time to start tracking down some records. Well, first, we start with what we know. Review what you already have about your ancestor. You know, go through your existing research and the documents that are hiding in your uh, file cabinet because sometimes the answer we seek or a clue towards the answer that we seek is right under our noses. So I kept getting hints for this fellow. 
indicating he was in the U.S. Navy during war, World War II. Now, it, this is Timothy, and he was born in 1899. So I didn't give a lot of credence to the hints. I didn't really project them, but I didn't really dig into them either. Well, one day I was reading through some letters that Timothy's sister Patricia wrote to their sister Margaret. And Patricia says, oh, by the way, here's Timothy's new military mailing address. Uh, he's been assigned on to such and such a ship. Oh, I have some confirmation here. So I uh, almost immediately sent off for a copy of Timothy's naval uh, service file. Um, the documents, because it was Navy, his record survived the infamous fire of 1973. Um, but the documents in the Navy file led me to his railroad pension file. He worked for the uh, railroad. And that file included a widow's pension application. And that application gave me answers to questions about whether or not he even was married, who his wife was, and whether or not they had children. Questions my family's been trying to answer for years. And none of those records, not the letter confirming he'd been in the military, the service file, uh, or the pension file were online. Once you've gone through your own things, make sure to reach out for reach out to family. Uh, this can include parents and siblings, but also your cousins, your extended cousins, your aunts, your uncles, your nieces, your nephews. Uh, DNA matches if you've done DNA. Um, see if anyone in the family has stories that they were told that they'll share with you, or if they have a stash of old letters and records, maybe even photographs that they would be willing to share. You now, the best part of this tip is that thanks to email and social media outlets, you can do this from your couch. All right. Now, once you've exhausted your home sources and your family collections, it's time to look for records held by everybody else. And we're gonna do this by conducting what's called a literature survey. Now records do travel, travel just like people do, but you wanna start with the ancestors, uh, with the areas that your ancestors and their fans are known to have lived in. And you will, if you will pardon the pun, branch out from there. So what types of organizations and groups should we be seeking out? Well, state archives. Many of the state archives, and there is one, each for all 50 states, and I believe DC also has an archive. Um, they have a catalog of their holdings on their website. It's very handy. And you can search those. We'll talk more about that in a bit. County courthouses and recorder's offices um, are great places to get local records. Historical and genealogical societies. Even if they don't have records, uh, the people who are members, especially active members of these groups, uh, tend to know where things are, where, where they can direct you. There are thousands upon thousands of Facebook groups out there um, that specialize in every single facet of genealogy you can imagine, and a lot of them focus around specific places. So these can be a great way to connect with locals. Occupational archives, such as a, a union archive or a church archive. Speaking of which, church records are not just limited to baptisms, marriage, marriages, and death. You can uh, look for membership roles and other uh, documents that could name your ancestor or their fans. Lineage societies. Um, you know, sometimes we think of lineage societies as not really having anything other than personal histories, but that's kind of what we're looking for. And even some of the older applications that um, might be a little light on uh, supporting documentation can give us great hints. Public and university libraries, as we talked a little bit about with UCR, and believe it or not, museums. You know, we think of museums as being places where you go to um, see 3D items. You might see a collection of fashion items, or you might learn about natural history and the local flora and fauna of an area. But a lot of museums also have research libraries and volumes of books, and some of them also have documentation that go along with the items that have been donated and that they are um, putting on display. 
So once we have a, an idea of where we want to look, how are we going to figure out where these places are? Well, Google is your friend, generally speaking, or whichever search engine you prefer. Um, let's take a look and see what is in the Riverside, California area for genealogy. Well, first results. Um, first, we get the family search um, wiki page. We're going to talk more about the wiki pages in a bit. But we also get the Genealogical Society of Riverside right there at the top. And uh, because we happen to have one of the National Archives offices nearby, you also get the National Archives at Riverside location information as well. So there's some, some potential resources just on a quick Google search. There are also many online resources that serve as hubs. And they search many repositories for potential sets of records uh, all at once, or they list on, online and offline resources on a single website. So let's take a look at a couple of those. I'll give you some hints and pointers that will work in the search engines of these websites and others, um, including those listed in your handout. You may be familiar with Cindy's List. If you haven't spent any time exploring Cindy's List, I encourage you to do so. So Cindy Engel, the creator of this website, she searches the internet for genealogically relevant records, online or offline, and she adds links to that information to the appropriate subject categories. Now you can browse the categories. Um, it just click that, you get to genealogy categories, and there's it, that list just goes on and on and on. Um, and you can kind of keep digging. Now, if you're looking for several kinds of records in a specific location, you can also use the search bar up at the top of the page to search exclusively within Cindy's list for anything that matches those terms. So this doesn't, the big wide internet, this is specifically results within Cindy's list. Um, and in this case, as you can see, we put in Bureau County and we've got things for um, maps as well as family associations. So you can um, look for multiple types of records based on what location you're working with. So speaking of search terms, you know, we have to search a little differently than we've all gotten used to since the golden age of genealogy brought us indexes and optical character recognition, making it easy for us to search for our ancestors just by plugging in a name. I bet a lot of you probably remember the good old card catalog. This, uh, I spent hours and hours inside of a card catalog. Well, what's the search strategy, right? If we don't know the title or the author of the book we wanted, we did a subject search. Um, we went to that section with all the subjects and to find volumes that could potentially hold information for us. And then we'd make a list of all the call numbers and go to the the shelves and uh, pull the books down and flip through them and see if they were um, potentially helpful. We need to return to this method of searching and researching. So subject searching and its uh, more modern companion keyword searching are critical to our success in finding things about our ancestor and their experiences. So the difference is that subject searching uses the subject headings that are added added to the catalog entry when the listing is created. Now, these subject headings come from a predetermined list of possible terms, and uh, it's actually a huge series of books that have all the subject headings, and I don't own them because it would take up three bookcases. Well, maybe not many. In any event, it's a predetermined list, which means you have to enter the subject heading uh, that you're looking for exactly as the cataloger who created that um, catalog entry used. So you're going to have to do a little bit of mind reading and good guessing. Maybe you don't know what the exact subject heading was, or you want, just want some more flexibility. Uh, you want to search with keywords rather than subject, because keywords are going to insert search the entire catalog entry, not just the subject headings. Um, sometimes you actually will look through the entire record for matching terms. Now, of course, when we do keyword searches, sometimes we get way more results than are useful. Um, so you can always um, start big and then refine it down. 
using additional keywords or specifying, you know, maybe you only want matches that include all the terms or that the terms have to be in close proximity to each other. You are looking for records about uh, St. Mary's Catholic Church. Um, you're not looking for records about St. Mary who three pages later went to a Catholic church. So you can tell it, give me this phrase. Another great kind of information hub is ArchiveGrid. Now ArchiveGrid holds uh, information about over 5 million records, uh, excuse me, over 5 million uh, entries from over a thousand different archival institutions worldwide. So you can locate holdings in these participating archives um, all over the world, right from your own couch. Now this is part of WorldCat, which you may already be very familiar with. This is a great way to find out where published items, such as books, uh, happen to be before you go buying them all on Amazon. Uh, you might, you, maybe you're checking to see if it's at the local library. But back to ArchiveGrid. There are two ways to search the database here. First, we can go in by zip code or location. Um, this is especially helpful if you're planning a research trip and you want to see what archives might be near your destination and kind of browse their catalog um, ahead of time before you get on the ground where you're heading. So I did a search for Riverside, California, just to see what's in my local area, and up popped the California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. They have a special collections and archives. I did not know that before I did this. Um, if I want to browse their collection in a little more detail, I can search the collections. And in this case, we see that, um, at least as of a couple of years ago, uh, Cal Poly had 76 special collections um, in that archive um, catalog. One of those is uh, this collection of World War II letters from 1942 to 1956. And now remember, I keep saying records travel. And this is a great example. These are letters that were written in World War II by uh, service members who were on the European front, uh, who had been Western, Western Kentucky University students. And they wrote back to their fac the professors and the faculty there at the, at the university while they were in the military. And those letters have all ended up in California. So if you have somebody in your family tree that went to Western Kentucky University during World War II, you might be interested in this collection. The other way to search is by subject. Now I put this together while I was working on those Chinese Exclusion Act uh, files at National Archives, so that's what I used for my example. And there are across uh, the participating repositories in ArchiveGrid 320 different collections of records that in some way relate to um, this, this, this um, situation. I picked one at random. This is at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, which is in Northern California. And it's um, the Chinese in California circa 1851 to 1963. So this is a set of records that, um, that hasn't really traveled too far. So let's say I'm really interested in this. Happily, uh, there's a little contact information button um, on these listings and they will take you straight to the website. Um, many websites, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in just a bit, um, will give you contact information right there, and some of the bigger universities and libraries will have an Ask of a Librarian feature, where you can actually just do a chat, a typed chat, with somebody who works at the library. Now, I would be quite remiss if I didn't talk more about the Family Search Wiki promised you I would, so here we go. If you haven't made use of the wiki yet, that's your homework, <laughs> you're, but really you're in for a treat. Volunteers and staff have assembled miniature locality guides for places all over the globe, and this is completely free. You don't even have to have um, an account at Family Search. You don't have to be logged in at Family Search. Um, after my map guide, this is my favorite place to get a quick um, rundown of what's available in a specific place or time. So I go to the research wiki. 
from going into the wiki, you get um, this section where you can research by place or topic. And it's the same thing, either place or by subject. Um, for fun, I put in Clay County, South Dakota. And uh, these are a portion of the results. Now, I had to shrink it down because this thing just goes on and on. There's a ton of information in here for Clay County. Um, up at the top, we have a description of the county, then a direct link to the county courthouse. Um, but you'll notice a little table there. It's got kind of, kind of pink and, and uh, blue uh, writing in there. And it's the known beginning dates for major records, birth, marriage, death, court, land, probate, and census. Now, you, I know you can't read that, um, but marriage records in Clay County, South Dakota, begin in 1880. Well, if you're researching somebody who got married in 1870 in Clay County, South Dakota, uh, and you see this, you'll realize very quickly that uh, maybe there isn't a, an official recording of the marriage and save yourself some effort. But looking a little more closely at this, um, you can, you know, there's the description, you get the county courthouse, um, and you get a table of contents there on the left. Now, it's all in blue because it's all hyperlinked, so you click on any of those and it will uh, skip you down to that section. Where you will find information about known record collections, um, it's by no means complete. Like I said, this is all volunteers, um, pretty much all volunteers, uh, and they're doing a great job, but it, this is a lot of work. <laughs> And there's a lot of resources out there. Family Search has very uh, wonderfully filled you in on where the records are, if they're going to link it, and whether or not those records are going to cost you money. As you'll notice, the first one, the naturalization, 1904 to 1928, says Ancestry, and there's a little dollar sign uh, on that entry. So it's going to warn you if you're about to go to a paid site. All kinds of good stuff here. So this is the last website we're going to talk about today um, to help us locate records wherever they are in the world while we're comfortably on our couch. Um, and that's Chronicling America. Now this website is hosted by the Library of Congress and it's completely free. Now there's two sections of this website. The first that you're looking at right now is the collection of digitized newspapers, which runs from about 1789 through 1924-ish. Um, and it includes newspapers from all over the country. So they focus on uh, newspapers that are in the public domain. Uh, public domain is up through 1924. Um, and then of course there are some papers after that as they've been given permission to digitize. But what we're really gonna talk about today is the US newspaper directory. This is a catalog of every known uh, newspaper that has been published in this country beginning with the very first one in 1690, and there are over 150,000 titles in here. You can browse by title of the paper if you know it, uh, or you can, and most often I'm looking to figure out what's available, so you can go to state, and then you can narrow that down to a county, and even as uh, narrowly as a city if you want. Give it the date range. Now the date ranges are in decades, and we're gonna talk a little bit about how that's gonna affect your results. Um, if you're looking for something from 1868, for instance, put in 1870. Any keywords that you may wish to use? Um, frequency is how often the paper was published. Language. Newspapers in America are as diverse as the people in America. And there are newspapers in all kinds of languages. So if your ancestor was you know, newly arrived from, say, China or Germany or Ireland uh, or France, you may want to look for a newspaper in that language because they may not speak English quite yet. They also have ethnicity presses. Um, in this case, we see Belgian in there. Um, perhaps we have a, a group in an area where there's lots of uh, newly arrived Belgians and a lot of them speak French, so they've you've got a Belgian published newspaper that's published in French. This will help you kind of narrow that down and, and think a little bit more outside the box of what may be available. The labor press newspapers are especially interesting. 
because these types of newspapers don't focus on a geographic area, but rather a demographic area. Uh, so my father-in-law was in the aerospace industry and he actually does show up in an industry newspaper um, that was published on the East Coast when he lived on the West Coast. So it's it's a different uh, focus for the paper and you, they're not restrained to geographic area. You can specify what type of material it is. Um, I always, I'm usually in here on a fishing expedition, so I don't really care if it's online or if it's original or if it's a, a microfilm, but you can narrow that down if you wish. And if you're feeling um, really um, uh, detailed, you can even put in the Library of, Catalog, uh, Library of Congress catalog number. You can pick some of these, you can pick all of these, you can pick, you know, you're need to pick at least one or two of them. Um, but once you're done picking, you just hit search and get your results. Um, I decided to, as a test, put in for um, Randolph County, Arkansas. My aunt James Jackson, from our earlier example, lived in a tiny community of Pocahontas for most of his adult life. And I put in those dates, some of the first half of his uh, adult life there. And I want to see what's here. So that's all I did. And in this case, I only have five newspapers. It's not too bad. You can sort by relevance, you can also sort by, um, I think it's date, um, and you can change the number of results per page. You get the name of the paper, the location of publication, and the date range. So, as I mentioned, you, your search is based on decades. I put in 1850 to 1880, but as you can see, item number three there, the Randolph Herald Index, uh, it was actually ran through 1884. So you're going to get a little bit of overlap on either side of the dates that you specify. We're going to say that the Randolph County Courier is the one I'm interested in. I want to start with that one. You click on that link and you go to the full catalog entry. Um, and it just gives you a little bit more detail about the newspaper. Uh, you can click on libraries that have it or on holdings. I don't know why they named them two different things, because the link will take you to the exact same place, which is going to look a lot like this. Uh, in this case, we only have one library that has this newspaper, um, and it's the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland, Ohio. But this is an Arkansas paper. The records move. Um, you never know where something's going to end up. We get a little more information about uh, what they have there at the uh, Ohio Society. Um, they're going to tell you that they have an original, so they have a physical piece of paper, it's not a microfilm. Um, they have one date, they only have one issue of this newspaper, and it's um, February actually the 18th, 1871. And they last updated that catalog entry in 1985. So it's been a little while since uh, they've updated that holding which may mean that it hasn't changed, it may mean that they're just behind. But we want to find out. And I live in California. I don't want to go to Ohio on a wild goose chase for one newspaper. Uh, so how do I find out what's going to, where this paper is and if they have it? Well, what I do is I, you know, I copy paste uh, right there from the holding straight into Google or your favorite search engine and uh, hit enter. Uh, most of the time you will go straight to um, the repository's uh, website, or a listing for it, rather. Um, in this case, we see that, you know, here we've got their website. Down at the bottom, we have a uh, little information about them, their address, the phone number, and uh, since I was doing this after hours, which is usually the case, um, they were closed at the time that I was looking for this information. So what do we do now? We have found a record collection that's of interest. We know where it probably is, but we're staying put on our couches. So how are we going to find this? Well, you know, a lot of historical societies and archives have posted information on their websites outlining how to do research. Um, so I always suggest visiting the website. Um, especially if you're on a roll and it's 11 o'clock and they're closed and you can't call them. Uh, you may be able to email or you may need to call them. 
as we saw with the Berkeley website, many web, uh, archives and libraries are using that Ask a Librarian feature. Um, you'll be connected with someone who works either at the library or within its network, so they'll be knowledgeable about what they have and how you can get access to it. For the few that aren't quite in the 21st century, uh, there's always good old snail mail. Now you do have to get up and go down to the mailbox, but you know, that's still better than getting on an airplane to go three states away. And uh, just as a disclaimer type reminder, I always uh, say do, do make sure that you're being very polite. Uh, in the majority of cases, the repository you're contacting has unfortunately other priorities than helping us with our genealogy. Um, you know, especially if it's a courthouse. Uh, so do give them a little extra time and understanding when waiting for your turn. They will get to you. And we're going to go back to that Western Reserve Historical Society um, and use them as an example because they've got a paper that we're interested in. So let's see what they tell us. Every website's a little bit different, but in this case we're going to research and collections, the library, genealogy. And we find that they give us instructions right there on the website about how to do research at their facility. And it says that researchers can access and make copies um, in the reading room. But it also says that reference staff can provide copies for researchers unable to schedule a visit. And um, they give an email address and a phone number to get more information about that. And they do mention that there may be fees involved. Now this, again, we're uh, going to remind you that every repository is going to handle um, their researchers a little differently, um, whether that's, um, you know, you have to physically come in to do it or they'll do a search. Now some will do, you know, if you have a very specific search, um, for instance, you just need an obituary, you know exactly when the person died and where they died, um, they may do that for you, they may um, do it for free, they may charge you a small fee. Some uh, will charge significantly more. Last I checked, the New York Public Library charges $40 an hour for research. Or, uh, and I've had this happen uh, on a few occasions, they may ask you to submit a request through the interlibrary loan system. The repository may also direct you uh, to your local genealogy society, or theirs rather, uh, to have your research completed. In some cases, you may need to find your own helper. Um, especially if the organization is very busy or you need more research than a simple lookup. Uh, every organization will have different rules and procedures to follow, so make sure to ask them, um, how do I get this um, information even though I live far away? Now this brings up an important issue. You should generally expect to pay for time, research time and or copy fees when you're reaching out to these places. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, that's kind of unreasonable that they would charge us. I mean, if, if, if we walked in, we could just view the records, that'd be free. And you're right. Most of the time, there are, there are a few that charge a, an, an admission free, but generally you're right. Um, but I, I urge you to keep in mind that in addition to being far less costly than traveling to these places in person, the fees that are being charged rarely cover the true cost of providing them to you. Uh, even if the fees are a little higher and they, they sort of cover those costs, um, mostly the fees just help uh, support the repository mission of preserving and providing access to the records. Because it's not just staff time in getting uh, the information out of their files and sent to you, it's also um, the materials to care for the items, it's the building rent, it's the electricity, it's, it's all the rest. So, so do keep that in mind. But sometimes the repository is going to tell you, we can't help you even if you give us money. We're too busy, we can't manage it, we're, we're sorry. You know, you can come in um, and look at this, but we can't look this up for you. Can you still get the information you want without leaving your couch? Well, that's the, well, of course you can. That's why we're here. Uh, organizations such as the Association of Professional Genealogists, um, I am a member, I'm not on the board or anything like that, and they don't pay me to recommend them, um, but they are there as a directory of professional genealogists uh, all over the world, and you can hire someone, uh, you can find someone and hire someone directly through APG, um, and through their directory, uh, you can look for um, 
if you need a research specialty, if you need a specific area, you, you know you need that record out of um, that Ohio library and you want to find someone nearby that can pull the records out for you. Now, many genealogy societies also provide this type of service. If your repository hasn't recommended one already, you can check the fgs.org website uh, to locate one in the area for your research. So there's a find a society button and you can uh, see who's in the area. And now you may be aware FGS is merging with NGS, which is the National Genealogical Society. So this is all going to be changing uh, sometime in the future, but for now, this is, and I'm sure they'll keep the directory once they switch, at least I hope they do, um, but for now you, you do still have this option. Now, if your budget is especially tight, and boy do I understand how that goes, you do still have some options for getting the research you need done. There are lots of Facebook groups out there. Um, some of them um, do allow you to post, hey, I need some help. Could any, is anybody willing to go do this for me? Um, and they may be willing to do some uh, in-person research for you. Uh, there's a newspaper lookup website a group. There's um, a couple of uh, random act of kindness ones. Um, they may be willing to help you. Now, do keep in mind um, to read the group rules. Some of them do uh, prohibit lookups from the big pay website. So you can't go on there and say, hey, could somebody get me this obituary from this subscription website? Um, because in a lot of cases, doing that is actually a violation of terms and conditions of the um, agreement between the subscriber and the company. Uh, so do make sure to read your Facebook group rules to make sure that you're not um, in, in a earnest in violation of those. So how do you get stuff out of a subscription if if you don't if you can't afford it if budget's tight and maybe the groups you're in aren't allowing you to do those lookups? Well, once they're open, uh, the local library, uh, the local family history centers. Uh, if you are near a national archives and there is one in Denver, um, there's they're all over the place. Um, all have subscriptions that you can use. Now during this time of being at home especially, many of these uh, subscription sites are opening up their library editions to folks to be able to use them remotely from home. So if you have a library card, local library, uh, check it out. See if you can access any of those subscriptions uh, as part of your library card uh, benefits from home. And if you are able to uh, become a library card collector, um, being in California, uh, the rule here is uh, that the big public uh, libraries generally, as long as you are a California resident, you can get a library card for anywhere in the state. And I've got library cards for Los Angeles County, which is about a two hour drive, um, Santa Clara County, which is up north. I've got them from all over the place. And some of these have uh, subscriptions or just other resources that uh, my local library doesn't have that I can get to. All free. You can also use the buddy system. Ask your friends and family members who live near the repository you need your research out of and ask them nicely for their help. And that's including even if they aren't genealogists. You know, they don't have to be genealogists already to, to help you. Um, in fact, one of my aunts, uh, she lived in Salt Lake during the 1990s and at the time she had no real interest in the family history. Well, my grandmother was putting together a big family reunion and there were some items that the family history library had that she really wanted copies of to share with the family at the reunion. And so she wrote to her daughter and said, would you please go down there and get these things for me? And uh, my aunt being a, a good daughter did so. And while she was there, she got infected by the genealogy bug. So now she's a, a genealogist too. So don't rule out your non-genealogist friends and family. They may be willing to uh, help you out. But you know, now that we have seen how records can travel, perhaps you have some genealogy friends or family members uh, who have discovered that there's records that they need for their family research that have ended up near you. And you can offer research and trade, you know, um, there's, uh, or just paying it forward. Okay, yeah, we're gonna have to get up and go somewhere for that part, but 
you know, it, it all evens out hopefully. And the reality is there's a wealth of information out, out there about our ancestors that's still lurking in dusty basements. It's sitting forgotten on shelves, preserved on microfilm rolls, and it's all waiting for us or our agents to discover it. It's so easy to get overwhelmed with the information already available to us and those billions of records online that are digitized and searchable and indexed. But if we stop at what's online and what's easy to get to, we will miss out on important pieces of our ancestor stories. And worst of all, we'll create brick walls for ourselves that simply don't need to exist. All because we've started to believe those myths that we started talking about in the beginning. So uh, with that, I want to thank you all uh, again for coming tonight. And I hope I've given you some new resources and ideas that will help you locate those items that are still offline, um, that do exist, but not might be online anytime soon. And with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Brian for questions. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sarah. You're welcome. Um, yeah, no. and we have a couple questions already in the chat box. Okay. Um, the first one is from Lee. It says, if we want to be part of the digitizing solution by volunteering as you have, what can we expect to be asked to do? Oh, that, thank you so much for being interested in that. That's fabulous. Um, so it depends a little bit about how you join the digitizing. Um, the National Archives in DC has, um, it's called the Citizens Archivists, where pe you can just come in and digitize some things and um, it's all supervised, but it's a very casual thing. Um, sometimes you get partners, the National Archives at Riverside, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act case files being digitized, that's in partnership with uh, a local college. So the funding is being um, covered through grants and things like that from with local students. So there's lots of different ways. You can also go down and volunteer, um, like I have at, and a lot of state archives um, take volunteers as well. So contact the archive you're interested in volunteering with um, and let them know, hey, I would love to come help. What do I need to do next? For the National Archives, because I'm a regular volunteer, uh, I did go through a background check. They do background check their volunteers. They're the ones that are gonna get left alone with things. Um, not that I'm allowed in the back on my own, but it's just the stuff they give me to work on in the processing room. Um, but I did go through a background check, I did get a badge. They will train you on what to do and what not to do. Um, there will be quality checks, those types of things. Um, obviously right now, most everything's closed, but that doesn't mean you can't help. The And I will be happy if you, anyone uh, on the call, if you would like to email me after, I will send you the link for this. The Chinese Exclusion Act files that had been digitized before things were closed uh, due to the current situation um, have been put online. They've been, they were released early because they didn't want to hold up anymore. There is an indexing project going on for those records. The goal is an every name index to make it easier for individuals to find um, their ancestors with those records. So there's lots of indexing projects you can participate in right now from home. And then once things do open back up, there'll be lots of things that we can digitize. Awesome. And then we have another question from me. It says, are there other good websites to find sources besides Cindy's list? Um, let's see. Well, the Family Search Wiki. Um, I'm trying to think. I know that there are um, a lot of genealogical societies and historical societies are putting up their own lists of items. So you might try um, the local society to the area that you're looking in um, to see what they may be recommending. Um, I'm trying to think what the other big ones are. Cindy's List and Family Search are the really big ones. And I am not thinking of the others right now, but if you email me, I will um, poke around and see what I can find for you. Great, no problem. All right, and then we have another question from 
see or low it says is there something similar to chronicling in america for uk india etc oh i have wanted one of those for so long i do um i have a canadian research project that's giving me fits um, and i keep wanting a newspaper listing um, my suggestion for overseas because i unfortunately i don't know of one off that, that exists that's quite like chronicling america however if you go to that country's national library, um, the National Library of Ireland, uh, the National Archives and Library of Canada, um, the British Archive. Um, a lot of the, a lot of countries have national libraries and the available records at that library t are coming online in a catalog. So that would be my first stop is to go to the National Library of that country and just browse the catalog for what newspapers may be available. Find My Past is aggressively going after newspapers. They've got scads of wonderful newspapers. And the, it's the main British newspaper, the one that started in 1666, um, but that has been completely digitized. It's all online, it's free. Um, the Scottish and Irish like sub, because it, it's more than one paper. Um, those national newspapers all, for all three countries have been digitized and they're online for free. Um, and same answer, if you email me, I'll send you the links. Great. And it looks like related to Lee's earlier question about the website, some people have posted in the chat box, um, stevemorris.com. Oh, yes. That's so a maybe good visit one. that. That's a good one. All right, we'll give about 10 more seconds for any extra questions from the audience. All right, if that is everything, then thanks so much, Sarah, for joining us and for this great presentation. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Of course. And we'd just like to um, remind everyone about our webinar coming up next week. And that'll be next week on Wednesday at 5.30, the same time. And that will be 2020 update, basics of ancestry.com with James Tanner. So we hope to see you next time um, for that. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. Thanks for joining us. And we hope you have a great day.